But uh, Miss Sharon, you got the scripture reading for today? Yep. Uh, the scripture reading for today is Luke 16, uh, verses 16 through 31. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is focusing their way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is com comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not come, also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The word of God for the, the, word of God for the people of God. Sorry, I thought you were done. Good morning, church family. Two things. Who is happy about the weather outside? Hot girl summer's gone, and now it's fat boy fall outside. Oh, geez. <laughs> oh, I love the temperatures outside. It's, it's, it's my kind of weather. Exactly. I was... But still, I think it was Thursday. I'm still surprised you were mowing as hot as it was. Um, I forgot what my second thing was. Anyways, we're going to move along. Now, my analogy for beginning of this is I think only a select few, the younger generation would know what I'm talking about, including uh, Jen and Curtis, especially Jen since she works retail. But... Do many of you know what a Karen is? Not someone named Karen, but quit laughing back there. <laughs> but a Karen. <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> Good. So actually people do know what I'm talking about. Boys, I got a question. How would you define a Karen? You know you want to answer that. <laughs> Bentley, do you got one? <laughs> Selfish. Let's go with that right there. <coughs> now, I'm not talking about anybody named Karen, and this is not to exclude anyone named Karen. This is just something that culture has deemed from certain people, and it's across both genders, uh, who act a certain way, a sort of entitlement or um, selfishness, so to speak. Um, they had tied this to certain haircuts, but that's, that's subjective, I think. But anyways, a Karen is someone who, act, who is very, really aggressive towards individuals and will use any means necessary to get what they want, including lying, trying to get a person arrested, or have that one employee lose their job due to lies. Also, the classic line of a Karen is, I want to speak to your manager in that tone. 
They will use whatever cockamamie lie they have to get discounts or free items just so the establishment will not receive a bad review. I see many Karens in my day working in retail with Walmart and other places. And it's pretty demoralizing when you as an employee are following the company rules all for the manager to come out and just roll over on his belly. He's like, okay, here you go. It's really demoralizing. But these Karens will use their status, their self-entitlement. They will not even see a person in front of you. They will just see an obstacle to get through. It's uh, pretty dehumanizing. But here's the thing, though. I do love seeing the videos where Karens get arrested in restaurants and in the middle of stores. Sweet justice. That, that, that's a joke, everyone. That's my own personal problem there. <laughs> so how does this all relate to today, then? We find ourselves here with, the, with Jesus telling the story of Lazarus and the rich ruler. During their lifetimes, Lazarus remained poor and sick. All the while, the ruler was living it up, not really lifting a finger to help Lazarus. We could assume that this ruler might be just like a Karen, throwing his weight around, acting like the sun revolves around him, walking like everyone should be blessed to be in his presence, and just overall not being a very pleasant person. The time comes when both men die, and Lazarus is carried off to be with Abraham, and the ruler is sent down to Hades. It is there in Hades where the ruler begs mercy and asks Lazarus, not Lazarus, Abraham to send Lazarus to dip pit Lazarus' finger in water to his tongue to cool him. Here's the thing though, the ruler who is in hell or Hades, he still has not learned his lesson. He only sees Lazarus as a means to an end, but not as a person. He calls out, let him serve me. Send him to tend to me, Father Abraham. Now, up to this point, I have made a lot of assumptions about the ruler, about possibly the contents of his heart. But here in scripture, we don't get that. We don't know if he was a good ruler or a bad ruler. We just know he was rich. Because after all, he did let Lazarus lay at his gates, begging, receiving the scraps off of, uh, of the ruler's uh, table. And that could be anywhere from food to maybe a few pennies here and there. Just not even the bare minimum of things. But although Lazarus was never cured of his sores, of his ailment, so what if the lesson here is not about how the ruler treated Lazarus, but about the gap or the gulf, if we want to make it even bigger, that is between him and Lazarus and him and God. After all, Christ said, the first will be last and the last will be first. In Hades, the ruler still does not see, see this lesson before him, and he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his family. But Abraham states, and I'm emphasizing my own comments into it, why should I do that? They already have Moses in the law, in the prophets. Why should I send someone else when the answer to life is already before them? The truth is already before them. Do you not see what is going on and why you are why you are where you are? God's truth, God's law is all you need to get back to him and yet you keep messing up and so do your brothers. And you do so in relying on your own understanding of what is right and what is wrong. These gulfs that are between us and one another and God as well are our own making. Jesus in this story is calling his listeners to be mindful of the gulfs in our lives between us as individuals. Not one person is above another one. 
The image of God cannot be ruled over another image of God, correct? We are all created equally, correct? Man or woman, Jew or Gentile, white or black, American or Russian, free or slave, free or prisoner, we are all made in his image equally. We all deserve to be redeemed by God. We all deserve, well, technically we don't deserve his grace, but we all deserve to receive his, the Father's grace this day. We all deserve to have freedom from sin and death. But here's the thing in this story. Jesus said, not says, but he provides a way for these gulfs to be fixed. These gulfs to be bridged because they can be fixed here and now today. But when you move on, not so much. The building material isn't there. But here and now, the material is there. Has anyone noticed in this story, God is not mentioned once? He is not mentioned one time. It is mainly Father Abraham and uh, not really, the rich ruler. Those are the only two people talking. The only other person mentioned is Lazarus. Five brothers. No, five brothers, thank you. I think that's very significant here. Because what Jesus is probably getting at here is the way to bridge these gaps is already before us. After all, what did the ruler's brothers have? Moses, the laws, and the prophets. We think too often of the power of the Spirit we have been given as an eternal thing, an individual thing. Our salvation is about making sure that we are right with God. But what if we can't be right with God unless we are right with people too? What if our internal transformation happens in concert with an external transformation? Meaning not only is your actions dictated by your faith, but also how you think and feel. Meaning what goes on here and here. Because after all, if you're just putting on a show with actions, have you truly even been transformed? Because our lives and our faith is about being about transforming not only people's lives, but our own as well this day. So I ask you, did the ruler ever truly see Lazarus at the gate? He saw him in the afterlife. That's no doubt about it when the cards are stacked against him. And that was it. Transformation begins with seeing people and giving their humanity back to them where society had once stripped it from them. We are not a community of Karens this day. We don't we, are, we do not see obstacles that are before us, but we see people who are loved by God, who are created in his image. We are a community where everyone sees an individual who should deserve the blessing of God's love, grace, peace, and mercy this day. Who in unison with us, wants their lives to revolve around God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with no gaps and no gulfs between one another and them and God. Amen.